Well, let's talk about some of the kind of similarities and differences in 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 pricing and quote to order. You know, one of the things, um, you know, I started off my career at Cisco Systems, and we we always thought we were very much different than everyone else, right? And I think a lot of companies are like that, right? When you, especially people have worked there, for, you know, good companies that people have worked at for a long time, and they have this impression like everything's so different in any other company or any other industry that I have to you know, uh, build something myself or, you know, I can't have an outside expert come in and 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 tell me anything because they don't know my business. Right. And obviously there's some truth to that. Right. Um, you know, especially when you're doing certain things that are fairly unique, like at Cisco, we had, you know, far and away the most complex and, and sophisticated channels program in the world at that time. Right. Um, so it was really hard in certain areas, but but at the same time, there were, there were like basic things around pricing and and having like visibility to a, a waterfall that you know would have been great to have, and and we didn't, right? And we just didn't, you know, have uh, a lot of uh, investment or focus on on pricing and price optimization. But you know, when I moved into the software industry, and now I've been seeing you know so many different industries and and uh you know different companies of different sizes across different regions you realize that there's yes there's you know uniqueness in every company and there's uniqueness in in industries but there's a lot that that's the same across different industries as well right um like i was actually struck by the first time i started talking to the construction industry um like the people that were like one of our companies our, our customers is called certainty and they do a ton of rebates ton of ship and debits just like what we did at cisco Right. And it's it just be, because of the 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 go to market and the channels that they're selling through were very similar in the way that they were managing pricing. So you get these parallels as well. So I, I thought that'd just be an interesting area since you guys both also look up across a lot of different you know industries and, and see the so similarities and differences. Yeah, I, I think there are some obvious differences. Um, but the biggest single difference is really speed. And I'll I'll illustrate that with with one Thing. First of all, a long, long time ago in, in my pricing career, I actually started writing down sticks and boxes of kind of a standardized pricing process. And I, I've kind of got in my head now a, a you know, an overall end to end process flow. And any industry that I go into, that same process flow can be applied. Now it's very generic and there's customizations that have to have to go on with that. And some of the things I think about are like if I'm in a yield management environment, which is very fast, uh, I have to think about my process in terms of time horizons because I might do different things three months out than I do one month out than I do the day of. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's going to be slightly different activities that I'm doing. And one of the uniqueness uh, the unique aspects of that is that I have to forecast my inventory and my unconstrained demand. And those are really my two probably unique things that I'm, I'm not necessarily taking into account when I'm in a manufacturing environment for, to some degree. Mm -hmm. But as I look at that, there are some certain aspects of that are, that are still applicable. Like if I think about process industries, I'm still wanting to forecast my demand because I, I'm highly motivated to keep my manufacturing facility running at high capacity because that's how I get efficiency. And that's how process industries have run their business for a long time. But they only in the last decade to 15 years have they started pulling that over to the commercial side of the business and saying, okay, how can the commercial side help me make sure that I'm running my business the right way. So there's an element of yield management, even in a manufacturing environment. Um, another example is uh, where, like if I think about consumer packaged goods, one of the, the biggest concerns about consumer packaged goods is how do I manage my trade promotions? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's my lubrication for the interface between the CPG company and the retailer and ultimately the consumer. And so as I think about that, you know, there, yes, that's a, a, di a bit of a different mindset. There's a different timeline where I have to make that investment, but it's still a customer investment that I'm making just like a front end or a back end rebate or 
uh, even a discount, all of those are customer investments that I make for a very specific time and for a very specific purpose. And that's, that's to drive volume usually. That's, mm-hmm. that's my primary purpose of that. And I still need to have a closed feedback loop that tells me, did I make a good investment or a bad investment? And so that next time around, maybe I reallocate those investments. So the, even though we call them different things, we call the levers different things. And even though if I put two waterfalls from two different industries side by side, they would look very different. Largely, I can map those buckets or at least big sets of buckets together and they look exactly the same. And so down to the fundamental level, really the biggest difference among all the industries is the speed with which I have to process information and make decisions. So if I think about, you know, yield management environments where I am, uh, I'm making near real time decision pricing decisions, and I'm managing by fair class and things like that in the case of an airline, same set of decisions different timeline than I'm operating on in a process manufacturing environment. If I think about volatility of demand, if I operate largely on long-term contracts, my volatility of demand does matter, but it's only going to matter for a certain customer at the point of contract. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I think about retail fuels, my inputs are going to change, you know, every day. And if I could man, if I had a process that could manage it, I would like to change my price three or four times a day, perhaps. Absolutely, yeah. So that volatility of demand, the speed with which I need to change pricing, perishability of inventory, all of those things are about the timeline on which I operate, not really the process through which that operation happens. Yeah, that's that's good. All good points. Um, Paco, anything you want to add there? Or? Sorry, the only thing uh, I see, the only thing I see as a commonality is um, every single business, one way or the other, is uh, being disrupted digitally, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That imposes uh, the need to become faster and digitized process that you maybe don't, didn't think you need to. And one of those is pricing. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So so the speed, to Chuck's point, the, the speed varies, but they all all industries need to get faster, right? And more dynamic. So the definition I remember, Chuck, you were talking about at PPS when you were talking about dynamic pricing, right? And and I actually uh, referred to it in my speech as well because you know, the definition of dynamic pricing is gonna vary by industry. So that's kind of the same point that you're making, right? So what's dynamic in process is different than what's dynamic in retail or or you know, discrete manufacturing even per se. Um, and there's factors that influence that. There, there's also different challenges, though, right? So, um, and and you see a lot of those those challenges firsthand, and, and get a lot of you know interaction with senior leaders. So, what are the, some of the biggest challenges that you've seen, Paco? Maybe maybe you can take that one. Um, you know, in terms of the digital transformation and, and pricing, and specifically. Yeah, I think that the uh, the uh, surprisingly uh, every day that passes, IT is not a challenge anymore, right? I mean, we traditionally talked about IT as being the major challenge in, in tra- digital transformations, and, and, and that is going to get easier and easier with time. What is really hard is uh, still will remain to be hard is changing people behavior, right? And, and we uh, see this in, in three levels. One is at the sea level, like uh, even when all, I think all CEOs uh, understand the challenge and want to tackle the, the opportunity, uh, they need a very clear vision and a very clear strategy to feel comfortable, right? So, so one of the first things is how you can articulate for a specific company what is the full potential of a digital transformation and how you can uh, take that uh, a level below and actually articulate what does that mean in terms of uh, growth in terms of uh, overall value of the company, so they can go and have a a good discussion with the board to actually get approval 
on the vision and on the execution, right? Until you get uh, to that point, is is everybody will claim that that uh, they want to do this, but but in fact there is no commitment, right? So so that is one of the of the key challenges. Uh, of course, the second becomes okay. Now that you have a business case, a vision for you know how this company should transform in the next ten years. What makes sense to, to change and uh, what is the value is how you, you convince the organization that this is the way to go, right? Mm -hmm. And this requires uh, a fair amount of effort on showing them what is the potential disruption that is happening in their market, showing them examples of how other companies are taking advantage of technology and new ways of working to become better and faster, uh, but also to acknowledge where they are, uh, uh, what is the point of the part of the company, and what are the strengths and weaknesses, and therefore create a plan that actually identifies those gaps and has a very uh, credible way to close them that everybody understands and articulates, right? And then yeah. it becomes a matter of changing the processes and the technology, right? But it's, it's I guess, an important point is this is a challenge in terms of uh, a decision of the company to transform rather than just uh, a technology challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that kind of gets towards the, the process that, that you take companies through and how you enable this transformation. Um, so can you maybe just talk a little bit more about that, kind of how you approach this and how you lead companies through this this change and and help them you know prioritize and and these kind of things. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very important point, uh, uh, Gabe. Because as, as we discussed, this is this is hard for most of companies because they've been operating in a certain way. So so we call we call these uh, uh, we we follow a two prone approach. One uh, one that uh, tries to depict what we call the future back vision, which is basically if you think in any kind of business, in any kind of industry, and you think on how this industry is going to evolve in the next 10 years, uh, you may know, you may not know when things are going to happen, but uh, you have enough examples today to develop a vision that is is, is good enough in terms of, of what are the main trends, right? So, so for example, for, for this client, the home appliances company, uh, the future says something like, you know, in, in the future, I mean, people doesn't need the washer machine or the refrigerator. They, they, they need to eat and they need clean clothes, right? And there might be different ways of actually satisfying those needs, right? Uh, An appliance is just a mean, right? So uh, are, do we think that appliances are going to be needed in the future? And if we think that they are going to be needed, uh, how we envision that appliance, right? And, and for example, for, for this company, it, end, it ends up being an ecosystem vision, right? The people will want something that together with the appliance plus other electronics and appliances in the house plus an ecosystem of applications help them to fulfill that need, right? So, so, so we need to develop a clear enough vision uh, that, that the company so the company can imagine that future. Then you have what we call the present forward, which is, okay, what is your, your position in the market? What are your strengths? And basically what you have today that we can use to build upon that vision or what you don't have today that we can, that we really need to fix and, and, and focus on in the next three to five years to accelerate your trajectory towards that vision, right? And when you put those two visions together, you end up with a very clear digital strategy that tells you uh, uh, in a very prescriptive way what you need to focus on in the short term, but also uh, portraits, what are the key trends that you need to pursue and follow in order to uh, remain relevant or become a leader in that kind of distant future that, that you just Im imagine, right? And after that, as you can imagine, it's very easy to identify the needs uh, of processes, and strategy, processes, and strategy, and technology that uh, you need to act. On. And yeah. I, I would I would add a couple of things to that because uh, I I think Paco articulated you know very well exactly 
how to how we guide our clients to think about it. I think the important thing through the journey of the transformation, though, as we start to really execute against that are number one, taking that future back vision and distilling that down to what I call the North Star. You know, what is that thing that we're really shooting for? And it, it's kind of that acid test for every decision that we're going to make on this transformation journey. Does it move us toward that North Star? So that's number one. And, and then number two, as we start laying that journey out, let's think about how do we shorten down the wins? How do we get, you know, I won't call them quick wins because people think about very tactical things, but how do we get down to, you know, whether it's 90 or 120 day wins so that the organization can, yeah, can start to feel the difference that this transformation is making. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that, you know, as we start to think about executives, how do we start to think of, make the executives happy that this transformation journey, I don't have to wait to the end to get value out of it. I can, my time to value is actually in the 90 day window and I can start to see real tangible results in a short period of time. And let's let's take that in sprints, just like in IT development. Let's let's steal that methodology and really build those sprints so that they have, you know, compartmentalized value that all build to, you know, being able to deliver that North Star. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the the agile methodology can be used across different you know, parts of the organization, just like we do in IT projects. And it's, you know, it's right. all about starting small, showing value and iterating. And I, I think that's where a lot of, uh, you know, IT projects, or digital transformation projects also probably go off the rails a little bit. You know, there's a tremendous amount of being money being spent. You look at the numbers, they, they always come back to, you know, 70% or so don't hit the mark, right? right? And I think a lot of them that don't hit the mark is because they try to take on too much. I've been part of some of those initiatives and I won't talk about them <laughs> specifically, um, but uh, yeah, to, to protect the, uh, you know, the, the fallen soldiers. But, you know, at this, at the end of the day, you know, uh, that, that approach, uh, you know, especially today where, you know, the analysts and the, the calls, you know, and the, the results are, are on such short timeframes and, and there's almost, um, you know, you want to think strategically and, and go to the, that North star, but you always have to be showing value and proving your worth. Right. So if you're trying to take on too much, we call it, we call it the organizational attention span. It's just not, it's not more than a quarter, right. You need right. to show value that quarter. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, um, cool. And so, so speaking of the kind of senior executives, I want to talk about that because you you guys both have the opportunity to to interface a lot with senior executives and and uh, and understand what kind of pain points they see around pricing and and quote order and digital transformation. So, can you talk about that a little bit? What keeps you know what are the common kind of things that you hear there and kind of what that keeps the C suite up at night with regards to you know pricing and digital transformation. Yeah, so so one thing I, I want to point out is as we were talking about the, you know, kind of the, the growing tide of focus on pricing, one of the trends there, and, and I think one of the things that will continue to, to drive some pro progress there is that there is more attention on pricing issues in the C-suite. And the, the most significant and and the most successful transformations around pricing that I see are ones where there's actually a C-level executive, a true C-level executive that is responsible for and owns pricing. So having somebody who's really accountable for that in the C-suite that can be in that, that CEO staff meeting and really report out on progress and be held accountable for transaction profitability, not only net profit, which has all kinds of a, a accounting games that can be played, but how do I hold my my organization accountable for economic profit at the transaction level? And, and that makes a huge difference. Whether Sometimes that's the CFO. Certain types of CFOs will never, ever get there because they are, they are in the accounting mindset instead of the economic mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but finding that C-level executive to focus on it, number one, is a, is a key success factor. Number two, 
I, I, and I, I think we'll talk about this a little bit later too, but being successful at, at the sea level, there, there's a tension there, right? There's always going to be the tension on how do I drive profitability versus how do I make sure I get the volume that's going to, you know, at least in perception, keep my company healthy and happy and keep my analysts happy and, and all those types of things. And different industries have analysts that focus on different things. They might be, you know, in the CPG industry, it might be shelf price realization. Uh, it might be, you know, pure volume in a distribution environment. Uh, it might be gross profit in some in some sense, or uh, in the case of, of process industries, it's often some some measure of operating profit that matters. Um, you know, the, all of those are slightly different measures that are going to have different considerations from a, a pricing is going to affect those differently. Mm -hmm. And so as a senior executive, if I'm truly going to transform form my organization and open up my profit generation capability, I have to learn to reconcile my communication with all of those stakeholders. I mean, even if it's not a public company, maybe it's privately held or private equity held. I still have to communicate to those stakeholders what I'm doing and how that action that I'm taking is going to affect the me the metrics and the measures that you're using to compare me against other companies and to compare my performance against my historical performance. And mm -hmm. that's a that's a tension that's really difficult to to manage. And oftentimes you know, through the course of, a, of an economic cycle, say, let's, you mentioned a quarter, oftentimes the quarter, you know, public company, they live and die by the quarterly earnings and mm -hmm. revenues expected and all those things. Well, I had, I had one client that, you know, pretty hilariously called the transformation from the focus on pricing and profit taking to volume. They called that, we transform into burn the furniture pricing. <laughs> you know, so by the, you know, three weeks left in the quarter, they're tr lagging on volume. I don't care what the price is, just get the volume in the door because we mm -hmm. got to hit our volume number. And it wrenches the organization around the sales organization, the pricing organization. They don't know what to do because, you know, hey, you've told me discipline, discipline, discipline. We've been telling customers and maybe even walking away from some deals because we're maintaining pricing discipline. And then all of a sudden you want all that volume back and you don't care about pricing anymore. Yeah. And that that kills the credibility inside the organization, but it also hurts the credibility in the outside of the organization. I mean, yeah. when's the last time you bought a car that wasn't at the end of a of a financial period? Right. Because we all know that the salespeople are highly motivated to get those sales through the door the you know, the last week of the period. And it's Absolutely. just, it's silly as a consumer to, to buy any other time. Yeah. Same Ma thing is true in B2B pricing. Yeah, absolutely. So you train your customers to, to wait. It's the same thing with, with promotions too, that, that, uh, yeah. you know, that you can get into trouble. Cool. That's, that's great advice. Anything you want to add to that Paco? Um, I think that a couple of, of, of things, um, you know, the, 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 our current client, the CEO was the, the thing that, keeps him at night is, I know we have a lot of data in all the transactions we do with clients that we're not using. And I know that that data, it's money, right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, I know that we can do a better job with all the outside data we can have to have a better base price, right? So I know that we can have a better base price, but uh, I just don't know how, right? So, so I think that, a platform that allows them to articulate uh, how to answer those two questions in an organized way is very important. And, and, and then this other client in a CPG company, uh, basically what is happening with COVID is I know price is going to be pushed, right? So there are two questions there. One is how much can I protect the base price? Uh, and, and how can be, I become more effective with promotions? This is a category that, is, that doesn't have a lot of promotions, but we see that it's going to be a pressure for categories that were, you know, very um, stable to have to work with promotions in a more um, active way 
in this post-crisis uh, uh, with the COVID. And then the, the other thing is, if I have to give away price, how, where, and when, right? I mean, those are the two questions that a lot of companies are having uh, because they know that, uh, that the, the downturn is going to put a lot of pressure in, in pricing. I have to say, though, that the, the first CEO that Paco was talking about there is particularly enlightened from a pricing and commercial focus standpoint. And I, I wish every CEO I dealt with had his perspective uh, on on the commercial organization, because I, I think companies, my clients would be much, much better off for uh, for that level of focus on it. Yeah. I remember That's talking true. to you, Chuck, about about why why that client selected us, and you said it was came down to speed and flexibility, right? And I think yeah. those those messages, you, you know, really tie tie this whole thing together with digital transformation of being, you know, agile, being able to, you know, be flexible with your pricing strategy and tactics, um, being able to change as you see the market changing. So having that data in. Uh, in the system and and then really having that speed and flexibility. So, you know, business agility, avoiding margin compression, reducing risk, those are some of the messages that as I talk to people are the ones that I hear a lot, right? Of, uh, and and uh, we we think we can, you know, jointly help a lot of clients do, do all of those things. So, I mean, we talked a little bit about what's gonna happen to those, you know, the companies that aren't changing that say, oh, everything's, you know, everything's fine. You know, my business is good. My profits are good. I don't need to change. Um, do you think those companies are going to be around, you know, in 10 years? Uh, Paco, do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, it's, uh, what if, I don't know, right, if they're going to be around or not. Of course, uh, it's, it, it would be very adventurous to say that they will not. But <laughs> what we see <laughs> as, 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 as a fact, right, is that there will be less money to get from if they don't change, right? The, the profit pools will, will will reduce. They will travel to other places. And, uh, and and of course, some of them, the ones that don't change, will have a, a harder time, right? Uh, overall, I think, I think uh, there is a compelling reason to change, but not only because they will be threatened, but also because there are a lot of opportunities, right? Right now, a lot of this has not been written. Uh, Companies that really transform themselves uh, can have a, a bigger pie and, and and actually make the pie even bigger, right? So so I don't know, Chuck. What, what what's your opinion there? Well, I'll I'll be bolder and say I I believe they will not be around. Um, <laughs> now that may be, and that's not talking about small business and things like that. But in, in right. major industries, if they don't get this right they're they're really really going to struggle and one of my favorite examples is the in the pc industry this was this was way way back but when there were two large com computer makers based in texas uh, one of them was was quite agile and the other one was not from a pricing standpoint and the the agile one knew that the less agile one would change prices on a Thursday and put their, they would put their promotions out on Thursday and price their laptops at such and such, whatever, $100 off, $200 off, whatever it was for the week, whatever laptop they were putting on sale. So this company would wait for that and then set their competing products just below that price. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, it's a simple illustration. It was even it, that this happened way before uh, anybody was really thinking about dynamic pricing in that industry and those types of things. But the less agile company doesn't exist anymore. Let's just put it that way. And right. the more agile company is is doing quite well. So uh, I, I think it's that's a microcosm of what will continue to be uh, to be the case. Um, because I mean, one, one of the great things, and this is, this is a bit of a Machiavellian perspective, but if you have all of the information, think about the things you can do to your competitors right? right. <laughs> in, in terms of, of, you know, how you compete in the marketplace. And that's not saying let's be predatory or anything like that. It's just saying, Hey, if I am operating with greater information 
who's going to win more often. Right. Greater it's, information and greater speed, right? It's like algo trading. Like, do you want to try to compete, you know, against that's the, right. against that? No, right. No, there's no way to do it, right? right? And And so, you know, I believe that's going to be, it's going to be such the norm, you know, call it, you know, I, I would go as far to say is even five years from now, I think that's going to be such the norm that, and, and it's going to be, make such a dominant difference in the way that people compete on price in the marketplace that without that, it's, it's going to be a hard struggle. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, um, so uh, I had uh, prepared a question here just to ask about your favorite business blogs or articles or books. Um, you know, I, I think we're we're getting a little bit long on time here, but uh, if you could maybe just talk a little bit about a couple, one or two of those that you want to share with the audience. Well, I'll, this this goes back to maybe you have a real answer to this, Paco, but my uh, <laughs> I, I spend so much of my life thinking about pricing and everything oftentimes my my greatest inspiration doesn't come from pricing blogs and and things like that although i do read them i i read tons of them out there uh i'm always always reading something but my greatest inspiration really comes from thinking uh, how uh, learning how people think in other disciplines so i read you know thing i'm always reading geeky uh, you know, back to my my double E background, but I'm always reading geeky books about, you know, how did scientific thought evolve? I don't know if you've ever read A Clockwork Universe, uh, which is a fascinating book about the development of scientific thought and through, you know, the development of the Royal Society and those types of things, or things like Fabric of the Cosmos, which is a, you know, an older book now, but it's, it, it helped me, even though I'd had a bunch of physics classes in, in college, it really helped me more viscerally understand relativity and, uh, you know, things like, and, and again, I'm not taking any, any view of, of universal origin or anything like that, but understanding the theories of that and how those came to be and how do people think about problems and how do people think about breaking those pieces of scientific thought down really helps me to, to really take that into my world and think about how do I break down problems and how do I do things differently than anybody else has ever done them? Because if, if we do things the same way all the time, we'll never get better. And so we have to push the envelope. And I believe we're still in a developing professional discipline, probably developing more rapidly than, than a lot of the other ones that we cover it as Bain. Uh, and I think it's important for us to, to think outside the box. So I like to push myself from, from that perspective. You know, I, I, that's a great question, right? Um, being in a, in, a, in a consulting firm like Wayne, um, exposure to a lot of different experiences. And, and as, as we speak in this crisis, we are helping retailer, financial services, uh, C, uh, CPGs, uh, manufacturers, and, and, and you learn all the time. And, but one of the things that I've learned, I would say in the last maybe four years is um, the, 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 the C levels of the future really need to understand what, uh, what, what the new ways of working mean for, for their companies and how they can leverage those, right? And, and, um, and one of those is agile, right? So, so it's, it's a, anything that has to do with how you can apply agile ways of working all the way from IT to change the behavior of the C-suite so they become an integrated, fully functional, purpose-driven team rather than a silo-based, bonus-incentive-based team. It's, it's very interesting to me, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, actually, we just launched a, a new book called uh, uh, doing Agile in the right way, right? That is, is launched today that talks about that, right? And, and you will find a lot of references in that book uh, about, you know, why this matters, right? And, and in this crisis, what we have found is um, 
companies have become more agile, right? They actually, because they have to work remotely, they have to, to make bad decisions. They, they became agile. And, and some CEOs are, are saying now, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to become to the old company that I was. I just want to continue making this decision in a fast-paced way and, 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 and orchestrate in a team-oriented way with a purpose in mind. So how I can manage that to stay, right? Uh, so uh, if, if, if any any book that, that talks about that, it's very valuable, right? So the one that we just launched is one. There is another one called uh, Extreme Ownership that has been around there talking about uh, how you actually empower uh, teams to to get that next level of ownership. Um, uh, it's it's also a very good one. Excellent, cool. And we'll put some links in the. Uh on the on the site for for those books so people can uh, can check them out all right well i think it's about time to wrap up um thanks so much for joining me chuck and paco it's been great really insightful i hope that the listeners find it as uh, as interesting as i do um but i am a bit of a pricing geek so you know I'm, there, there's there's some of us out there right but uh anyway so uh, you know i just wanted to give you guys the opportunity to add anything that you'd like just in closing here yeah, well, you know, first of all, if if you are listening to this, there's probably at least some element of pricing geek in you. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you at least know how important pricing is to to the production of of profit, and how powerful it can be. I and, and that's a pretty easy concept to get, and we talk about that a lot. But the hard part is, how do I go and get it? How do I actually do it? And you know, sometimes it can be a pretty scary topic, as we talked about earlier because you're messing with the the really the the engine of the company what is it that drives the company ultimately it's that that's how we bring value back into the company you know based on the value that we produce for our, for our customers and so you know first of all i would encourage you to make sure that that you are communicating with your organization about, you know, how we can take this on as a as a journey and as a digital journey, because the digital tools that are out there and the experiences of others can can greatly accelerate that. Um, but secondly, there are ways that we can reduce that risk uh, and ultimately providing this science that we've been talking about to your commercial organization and your commercial operation can offer a, ultimately a reduction in risk because we can start to see what are the effects of what we do in the marketplace. And thirdly, you know, of course, once you start to see that and you have real levers that you can play with, it's almost impossible that that is not going to drive significant benefit for your organization. Great, great insight. Thank you, Paco. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a great chat. Um, uh, it's, I, I work with Chuck a lot, and, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to be with you, Chuck, and with you, Gabe. Thank you. And and then I, I guess that the, the final my final ref, uh, thought here is this can be not this can be done right. It can be done in the right way. It will generate results in a short period of time, and there is a way to do it, right? I mean, there is, this is no longer magic. It's, 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 it's very close to your capabilities, and it can be something that you would be reaping the benefits in a short period of time. The technology is there, the processes are there, the way to convince the C-level is there. Just, just grab it. Yeah. Excellent. Now's the time. All right, well, great stuff. Thanks again, guys, and uh, thank you to our audience for knowing that pricing matters. Yeah. Thanks, Gabe. All right. Thank you. Okay.